and there she blows. We are officially in a correction with the S&P 500, meaning we are now down over 10% from the highs that we hit just within the last week. My oh my, how quickly things can spiral out of control. So in today's video, we're gonna take a look at the damage that was done, how ugly it got in certain sectors, uh, and we're gonna take a kind of a, a moment to step back and look at long-term investing uh, as an alternative. Uh, some of you have been waiting for a pullback for quite some time in order to get invested. Uh, today, I wanna focus on one dividend stock that I think holds a little bit of appeal. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome to the Market Outlook video. I'm your host, Brandon Van Zee, and it is February 8th, 2018. As a reminder, for those of you that are new to YouTube, we'd encourage you to sign up for our channel and subscribe to our channel. Uh, also click the bell icon if you uh, haven't done so already. That'll notify you whenever we upload new videos here. In addition to that, if you get value out of these videos, we'd encourage you to click the thumbs up icon on YouTube. And uh, you can also go down to the comments area and leave some thoughts for us if you'd like. And lastly, there's a description area underneath the video that will allow you to uh, sign up for our email distribution list where you can get access to all the daily clusters in addition to the link to the video that we send out to folks every night. I imagine there's gonna be a lot of oversold clusters uh, on a ugly close like we saw here today. Now, in addition to YouTube, we're also on Twitter. Uh, my handle is at Brandon Van Zee, all one word. Uh, follow my, my handle, follow the Market Scholars handle, which is market underscore scholars, and also follow David Settle's uh, Twitter feed as well. In addition to Twitter, uh, we're also on Facebook, and we'd encourage you to join that group. Uh, well over 800 of you have done so already. Uh, always enjoy uh, kind of getting together with you folks there online, so make sure you check out that web address as well. All right, so let's go ahead and dive now into uh, the S&P 500. And as you can see, we were down 100 points on the close. That is pretty ugly right there. In fact, that's good for 3.75% to the downside. Now remember all of the commotion that was made on Monday with a 4% move and it was, you know, it kind of caught people off guard. It's been a long time. In fact, I, I posted on, on Twitter that it had been since 2011. Uh, my son wasn't even born at that time. The last time we had a 4% drop in the market in one day, well, here we are four days later and we almost had another one. Now, obviously it's not as bad as it could be because thankfully Tuesday was a very robust up day. You guys will recall that I did the market outlook video that day. Uh, I still wasn't exactly pleased with what had happened, of course, and so that's why we took that bearish trade on the S&P 500 that day. We took advantage of the fact that we had this uh, oversold rally that day, got better prices than we would have otherwise. If you're now just putting bearish trades on down here, of course, you're gonna have a lot worse prices for your bearish trades down here as well. So as I mentioned on Tuesday, I would not be surprised at all if we get a lot of chop and slop here, uh, meaning that maybe this is the environment where you sell the rips and you buy the dips and vice versa. This might become more of a trading environment. Um, you know, the volatility is back. A lot of people saying that, you know, the, the trading desks at Goldman and at Morgan have been waiting for this for a while because this has been a one track market for quite some time. Well, volatility is back. Those of you that enjoy swing trading, this might start to become your territory a little bit more. You know, the last couple of years has been owned by the trend traders and we've benefited handsomely from that. But times are changing. This temperature is starting to feel quite a bit different right here. So, Hopefully, some of you have already put on some bearish trades. As you know, the market uh, forecast tool has been bearish for quite some time. The day that it went bearish would have been this candle that I'm pointing at right here. That was when the uh, green line fell out of that upper reversal zone and gave us our first bearish posture. And so basically, we are now one full week into bearishness at this point, despite the fact that it felt like the worst of it was either Monday or today. You know, any of those days could have been an adequate time to put on uh, bearish trades if you're comfortable with that sort of thing. So obviously today didn't help. Uh, we, we remain bearish. In fact, we got so bearish so fast that if anything, maybe there's a glimmer of hope that we can find some sort of stability here reasonably soon. The reason I say that is you'll notice down below we're getting very, very close to what's called an oversold cluster. Some of you might refer to it as a bullish cluster. The idea there is that markets 
go too far too fast in one direction and when you have all three of these colored lines on the market forecast that close below 20 on the same day that's what constitutes a bullish cluster or an oversold cluster we're not there yet so i want to caution you there we're close you can see that the uh, blue and the green line are knocking on the door of breaking down into that lower reversal zone the green line is at 23 and falling and the uh, blue near-term line is at 26 and falling so at that point, we might be able to find a little bit of stability. It doesn't necessarily mean we have to reverse what started here a few weeks ago, but at least uh, maybe uh, stop the bleeding to some degree at that point. To give you a, a good idea of that as well, maybe I should go back on a one-year daily chart. Oh, rats, we don't have any bullish ones here. What I'm looking for are little green dots. And uh, give me a moment, we'll find some. Uh, just have to go back more than a year apparently. So. Uh, let me check my time frame here. Let's go back two years and see if we can find one. Yeah, there we go. You'll notice back here, this is November 2016. Now, this is right before the Trump election. Um, we have two green dots right here. Now, that signifies a time when markets were so beat up, so oversold, that all three of those colored lines of the market forecast closed below 20 on the same day. In fact, they did it two straight sessions right there. So again, I wanna caution you because we're not there right now, but if things continue to spiral out of control tomorrow, which is entirely possible, um, then maybe we have at least one little glimmer of hope that, hey, maybe stabilization is along the way because you will notice right here before that Trump election, when we got those back-to-back -back cluster days, that was basically the end of it. Now, it's been a long time since we've had a bear market. I mentioned in the, uh, in the intro that we're now in a correction. That's 10% down from the high. It's been since 2008 and 2009 that we've had a 20% pullback from the high. I know in 2011 it was awfully close. So don't get on my case about that. It was 19% there, but it was not 20. And so if you look back in history, people that are looking throughout the decades where were our actual bear markets, the last one was 2008 and 2009, at least on the S&P 500. And so... We'll just have to see where this takes us. But things have unwound very, very quickly here. Maybe there's a chance to play a reversion to the mean to some degree. All right, let's get back on track, take a look at a couple of uh, more charts here while we're at it. And let me go to chart uh, uh, 6B here, which is gonna take a look at four different in indices here in the United States. And we're gonna look at it from a market forecast indicator perspective. And as, should be no surprise to anyone, uh, we have bearish posture across the board. We already had that on Tuesday. And remember, Tuesday was that big up day. Um, so if, if the big up day didn't reverse the bearish posture, then surely we're still having a bearish posture right now after the sizable drop the markets did see here today. It was ugly out there, folks. The Dow Jones was down another 4%. So you know, remember that the S&P 500 is the benchmark security. Uh, that's what is mostly tracked around the world. It's a little bit more of a pure instrument than something like Dow Jones, which is a price-weighted in index. Yes, it's more venerable. It's been around longer, uh, but it doesn't really m measure the market the way that the S&P 500 does. So I know most of you know that, but if you're new to, to trading, I would encourage you to take a look at the S&P 500 uh, as your barometer for what's actually happening with stocks, at least here in the United States. And so the Dow Jones was down a little bit more. I did see that Boeing, one of the hottest stocks in the last couple of years, it really uh, took uh, a beating here today. And so remember with Boeing being a high price security, it's gonna have a, a much bigger impact on something like the Dow Jones than it would uh, as a member of the S&P 500. As we look at the NASDAQ, NASDAQ was down 3.9%. Look at the Russell 2000. It was actually um, down the least amount. I don't know if we could necessarily call it our big winner of the day. Uh, it was still down 2.9%. Uh, all by itself would be uh, considered a horrendous day. And so, yeah, again, across the board, we've got bearishness. But notice again where we're standing with a lot of these uh, different lines, and we're getting closer. Now, none of these four indices, we do have an oversold cluster yet, none of them, but we're getting closer. Some of you that used to follow me at my previous uh, employer know that I put together a lot of research on uh, oversold clusters versus uh, overbought clusters. And what my research showed is that the oversold cluster was 
much more impactful. Its hit rate was a lot better than the, than the overbought clusters. And so what that means is when the markets pull back significantly, remember markets do go up over the long haul. And so when markets pull back significantly, there's usually buyers in the wings. Think of all the 401ks and the retirement accounts and the pension money. You know, that money has to find a home somewhere. Um, there, there's not a natural tendency for people to constantly short the market to push prices lower, but there is a natural tendency for people to keep on pumping their own money that they're making at their jobs into the market. So you kind of have an unfair advantage if you're bullish on the markets. But what I found when looking at these clusters and what I used as kind of a barometer of success was where was the market one month later after these various clusters? And again, I want to stress that the oversold clusters, the ones that we're getting close to right now, were much more successful, meaning that one month later, we found that prices did revert the other way. In this case, if prices have been coming down, 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 and let's say we start getting some of those clusters tomorrow on these major indices, then there'd be a reasonably good chance that a month from tomorrow, we'd have slightly higher prices in the market. So we're gonna take a look at that. You know, We're not there yet, but we're getting closer after the beatdown that we've seen here uh, this week. Let's go ahead and take a look at our next chart now. This is gonna be our three green arrows chart, or in this case, our three red arrows chart, because as you can see, all four major US indices are uh, colored in pink backgrounds on this particular chart. That means that we have three red arrows, meaning that we've got a red arrow on the moving average with price below a 30-day moving average. We have a red arrow on the MACD, meaning that momentum has been lost. Uh, you know, And that's one of the things that you can sometimes pay attention to as well. I don't want to make it seem like this will always give you a, a heads up that something disastrous is imminent. But you will notice that with something like the Dow Jones, Right, we hit this all-time high. Two days later here, we already got a red arrow on that MACD telling us that huh, something's just not quite right. There was a little bit of momentum loss that was taking place there well before we had this breakdown uh, on Monday and then, of course, repeated here today. Uh, so across the board, three red arrows and all these, what does that mean? That means if you're using kind of a three green arrow mentality to your trend trading, make sure you're abiding by your rules. You know, we've had, a, we've had a gravy train of a market for the last couple of years. We probably received uh, uh, gains in many of the stocks that we never deserved. And so we're happy to get those when they're, when they're around. But we have to remember when things start unwinding, then we start to have to make sure that we're, we're managing our risk appropriately as well. Some of you use stop losses. Some of you don't. Some of you hedge with, you know, futures or hedge with put contracts or whatever it is. But this is kind of that wake up call again, where it's a reminder that if you're not happy with what has happened here recently, then you need to start changing. How that uh, change comes about is entirely up to you and how you're, you're situated right now. Um, but hopefully you're picking up a few things here and there through these videos as well. If we take a look at our next chart, this is our 1040 crossover. And uh, this is kind of interesting. You will notice here um, on the Russell 2000 chart. Now, as a reminder for those of you that might be new to this video, um, these charts here that we're looking at are three years in length. All the other charts we've been looking at so far are only three months in length and use daily candles. This one is three years in length and uses a weekly candle. We'll take a look at what's happened here. In just basically three weeks of time, the Russell 2000, which was flying high, well above its 10 period moving average, which is this orange line here, has come all the way down, is already touching its black line. That's your 40 period moving average. And I mentioned a few weeks ago that I don't anticipate the crossing of a 1040 crossover uh, on any of these indices anytime soon, but the one that will likely get there first, if that is ultimately what's going to happen, is likely gonna be the Russell 2000. It had been the lagging index of these four uh, in recent time. And so you can kind of even see that here. Um, notice that this orange line, which again represents a 10 period exponential moving average, is now rolled over and is trying to go down to this black line here. And when that happens, we would view that as a very bearish thing, even for longer term money. And, and that's typically who's gonna be looking at a, at a particular setup like this. And you can see that the orange line is closer to the black line here on the Russell 2000 than it is on all of these others. But it is also worth noting that all of the others orange lines have started pointing down. Before we get too caught up with that, we have to remember that that has happened before and it's ultimately reversed. 
Um, so we don't want to necessarily just sell everything right now because, oh my goodness, it looks like it's going to go down there and cross. We don't know that to be a fact. Remember, these moving average lines are very slow and that has been a benefit to everybody. Sometimes people bemoan the fact, hey, my system is too slow or this, that, or the other thing is too slow. Well, in this case, when you're just trying to determine should I be in the market or not, a slow system has saved your behind for years at this point, right? Because the last time we had a crossover was way back in early 2016. And I think most people, despite having things like Brexit and other things along the way that were somewhat disturbing, you know, the, the Trump election, all that kind of stuff, most people would say they're very happy to be in the market today, despite the last week, um, than somebody who had been sitting on the sidelines since early 2016. You know, to each their own there. Maybe some of you uh, determined after this week, it's no longer worth it for you because of the emotional strain. And that's, you know, listen to yourself. There's, there's something to that as well. Know thyself as an investor. Um, let's go ahead and take a look at our next chart. And on this one, we've got our sectors 12 grid. So I'll kill the camera feed here. So that way you guys can see uh, the full screen here and all 12 of these various charts. Um, same thing as Tuesday when I was with you. All 12 of these are bearish, meaning that the intermediate line, the green line on the market forecast, is showing a bearish posture on all 12 of these. So remember that the, the chart in the upper left, that's your S&P 500. We already talked about its bearishness, but we do have bearishness across the board in every single one of the 11 sectors as well. And I think that's another uh, good point. You know, some folks, I think, um, misinterpret this idea of sector rotation, thinking that when markets go down, some sectors will be able to withstand that. And that generally is not the case. Most sectors that make up the market, as luck would have it, are going to be very correlated to one another. And when markets do spiral out of control, you will find relative winners and relative losers, but it is very normal for all sectors to go lower. So that's another important point because I, I, dealing with students in the past, I think there's this misconception out there in their head that, oh, okay, well, as long as I pick the right sector, you know, and I, let's say I, I go into uh, consumer staples um, right before a bear market, I'll be fine. My money will be safe and, you know, I'll be preserving my capital. No, that's not the case. At least from my perspective, that is not what happens. You may find occasionally that certain niches of the market, maybe an industry group could withstand the pressure, but typically the large sector basis, 11 different sectors out there, you're not going to find that they're going to be able to withstand the pressures of a full blown uh, bear market. But as I mentioned before, you should expect things like the staples, the utilities, maybe even um, healthcare to do better in a market pullback, but better in this case just means losing you less money than you would have lost otherwise. So that's an important point. Um, you gotta consider that as we go forward because it's entirely possible. It's, we're, we're overdue for a bear market, right? Uh, it's been since 08, 09. Um, could this be the start of it? Potentially, uh, we won't know. We do know right now, officially we are in a correction and it's been quite some time since we've had that. Um, as we look at these different sectors that are out there, you know, I'm, I'm looking for some, um, some clusters. Now you will notice that we have a cluster on XLE, that's energy. We also have a cluster down here on XLU and on XLRE. But I'm going to kind of disregard those in my own head, the last two. Reason for that is you will find that utilities and real estate are not really driven by the mechanics of their own business as much as they are driven by macro economics, meaning especially interest rates. The reason those two have been beat up as bad as they have in the last three months is because interest rates have continued to go up and up and up. It's not because your local electric utility company is earning less profits and that's the reason their stock is down. No, in, in many cases, they're actually more profitable today than they might've been a year ago. Um, the reason they're going down is macro, meaning it's out of their control. Um, Energy is maybe a little bit um, more in control. Even that is a little bit of a stretch because, of course, many um, oil companies 
are beholden to whatever's happening with oil prices as well, which is kind of another macro theme. Uh, but there they have a few more levers to pull, uh, meaning that you know you might have an integrated oil company that actually uh, is more profitable when their um, uh, refining division gets better margins as oil prices come down. Uh, to somewhat offset the amount of money they're losing in their exploration and production division. So uh, energy may be something to keep our eyes on right there. I, I do wish that the energy stocks would have held these prior lows. Those are the, the, the interesting types of setups that I, I like to see. Um, we do find here that today's low on energy, let me just uh, right click and go to maximize sell here. Notice that where we closed, first of all, it was close to the bottom. And let me just see where the low was on this candle right here. This was on December 8th, 66.69. I'm getting that, by the way. There's, a, there's an L colon up here above the chart. Some of you might not be familiar with that. That just means the low of the day of whatever candle you're pointing at. So again, I'm gonna come over here, point at this candle on December 8th. And the low price was 66.69. Today's low was 66.69, well, how about that? I was thinking that we breached that low. Turns out we went exactly to it. So that could be interesting. We'll, we'll have to see what happens tomorrow. You know, if I had to guess, I'd say that we're gonna start off with more selling pressure tomorrow. Uh, reason I say that is if we look at the S&P 500, I was really hoping we would hold the prior uh, lows that we had from earlier in the week. Let me go to SPX. Um, but you'll notice that we crossed below these lows here in the last 10 minutes of trading. So if I went to, let me go to a one day, one minute chart. It was right here in the last 10 minutes that I'm kind of circling right here that we broke the lows from before that. In fact, let me go back on a five day chart to highlight that a little bit better. Here's the low prior right here. And you can see if you kind of drift your eyes directly across my crosshairs, it was right here. It was literally like these last three candles at the end of the session that breached the low that we had from a couple of days ago. So that's unfortunate. I, I kind of wish we would have been able to hold those lows, um, and especially considering the fact that we weren't quite to 10% down up until that point. That last, Those last three candles here, they pushed us through that 10%. So now we can officially say we're in a correction. Not only that, but we're at the lowest lows of the week. Um, the prior people that were trying to formulate the bottom in the past with their money, that didn't work. So now we have to start searching for another bottom down the road somewhere. Um, so anyway, going back over here to uh, energy, you know, let's pop that back in. XLE is the ticker symbol. Hang on. I gotta go back to three month daily, there we go. Um, that one might be interesting. I, I'm not gonna hold out a whole lot of hope for it because it is heavily cyclical and we're literally one penny away from touching new lows, but maybe that bottoming process can start right in there. I, you know, I've been watching you know, stocks like Exxon and Chevron just taking it across the chin here this week. And so maybe there is something to that. I think Exxon, uh, as a matter of fact, has a 4% yield all of a sudden again. Let me just verify that before I tell you the wrong information. Uh, yeah, with today's sell-off, Exxon has a yield of 4.05%. You don't see that all that often. That's that's a fair, fairly rare thing there. So you might be finding a little bit of stability there in, in oil sooner rather than later. All right, let's take a look at another 12 grid. In this case, let's go to the foreign markets. And again, across the board, we've got red, meaning that doesn't matter if you're uh, hanging out here in the United States, uh, or if you're in Egypt, or if you're in Latvia, uh, or if you're in Singapore, uh, you're, you're probably feeling the sting of the global markets wherever you're at. So we can all kind of commiserate in our own uh, misery here uh, as a unified world as we kick off uh, the Olympics, uh, which uh, by the way, I was actually, uh, some of you saw on Twitter, I happen to be in Park City this morning. Many of you know that uh, they were the host of the 2002 uh, Winter Olympics. So I tweeted about that here a little bit earlier today. Remember to follow me at Brandon Van Zee, all one word on Twitter. Uh, but take a look at the lack of snow we have here in Utah right now. It's crazy. Uh, very little snow. This was the uh, facilities that they 
they did some of the uh, events in 2002 at, and even there you can see they're 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 really desperate for snow. Uh, we are having an, an incredibly dry winter here. So anyway, uh, good luck to all the uh, all the men and women that will be representing the U.S. and all the other countries of the world uh, starting this weekend. Should be another great uh, event for the world. But back on track with the foreign markets here. It doesn't matter where you're at. You're feeling pain just like all investors in the United States are feeling pain on the long side of the coin. As far as looking at those oversold clusters, we do have one here worth noting, and that's the United Kingdom. Notice right down here, we've got that uh, that green dot showing up. So let me go to maximize that cell. Let's investigate it a little bit further. And let's see, did we breach those lows, we didn't. So this one could be maybe somewhat interesting. Notice that we were able to hold the lows from back here in uh, November, and now we're getting this oversold signal here. It's possible we could have a bounce or at least a stabilization from here. And remember, that's not a guarantee. You know, basically what this is telling us is things have spiraled out of control too far too fast and the likelihood of that rate of change, that pace of that decline going forward in the next two or three weeks is very unlikely. That's what that's telling us. It doesn't tell us that it has to bounce back higher. It doesn't tell us that it has to go sideways. It's just telling us it's unlikely to find a plunge that we saw from here to here in the last three weeks to continue again for the next three weeks. But we've seen time and time again where reversions to the mean can happen. And if you were looking for an excuse as an example to get into the United Kingdom anyway, maybe this is a great opportunity for you to do so on sale. All right, let's go ahead and take a look here at our final uh, 12 grid, which is our intermarket analysis. And here it's a little bit more of a mixed bag, but remember that's intentional. This particular 12 grid shows things that are not necessarily stocks. And um, one of the big themes that we've seen here recently, of course, treasuries. Continuing to motor higher. Now we did have a bearish cluster over there, but it didn't stop that one last time either. So it's just continuing to go. We hit new highs on treasury yields here as of today. And that means the opposite for the bond prices themselves. You can see down below TLT continues to drift lower and lower and lower. And interest rates continue to drift higher, higher, and higher. And of course, higher interest rates can start to dent the margins of profitable companies as well. And maybe that's part of the story on why the market is starting to get a bit more nervous about the picture here uh, in recent weeks. Uh, the VIX had a big bounce back day. It was up 20% here today. Uh, but remember, it's been all over the board here in the last uh, three or four sessions. And so we, are, we remain at very elevated levels. So that then brings me to our trade application example for today. Now, what I wanted to do is do something a little bit different. Those of you that have followed me with these types of videos in the past know that I typically try to establish some sort of a trade that is based off of the posture of the market itself, meaning that if the if the S&P 500 has a bearish posture at that time, I do a bearish trade like I did on Tuesday. We had a bearish trade on Tuesday when we sold that bear call spread. Um, I'm going to do something a little different today. We have a bearish posture in the S&P 500. There's no denying that. But at some point, you need to try to discover value. Now, I shouldn't say you as in you, I'm saying kind of generally speaking, if you're somebody that likes to have a basket of portfolios as an investor. Some of you are purely traders and that's fine. If you're purely a trader, you're probably gonna focus on the bearish side of the equation. Typically in the past, I, I, I hadn't really talked about my long-term mentality here. I know many of you that follow me know that I'm uh, an obsessed dividend growth investor. That is my forte, that's my passion, that's what I love to do personally. Um, but that's a different type of methodology than what is taught during these types of videos that are oriented towards traders, not investors. So normally in the past, I got my fix because I had other classes um, that were different than this video where I could talk about that long-term mentality, where I could talk about scooping up potential value when they existed. I no longer have that outlet. Now, I will once David and I are up and running with Market Scholars, uh, looking forward to uh, doing a dividend growth investing class again where I can share some of my experience and my thoughts and my expertise. Um, and so that was always my outlet. I didn't need to do them in these YouTube videos because I had a class to do that in. I don't have that right now. So I'm feeling the need to uh, highlight an example here that 
is in a downtrend, but I feel is an interesting uh, candidate for a long-term portfolio for someone who doesn't own this particular stock yet and wants to go down the pathway of having a longer-term buy and hold, buy and monitor type of a portfolio. Now that stock is Procter & Gamble. Um, some of you uh, know that I talked about that on Twitter uh, as well. So again, make sure you're following me there on Twitter. But what I wanna show you right now, as I pull up Procter & Gamble, first of all, recognize it's in a downtrend. So that's why I'm saying this trade will not be for everyone who's watching this. If you're a trader, you're not gonna wanna take this trade. This is not a trade. This is an investment here. This is for someone, uh, I generally tell my dividend growth investors that when you're going down this pathway, assume you'll be holding this stock 10 years from right now. So if you truly have a time horizon that you're gonna be planning on holding this stock on February 8th of 2028, then this may be an opportunity for you. Okay, what I wanna do is I wanna come over here to uh, what I call my, my dividend stair step chart. Now, this is the chart that I would use in a lot of my uh, dividend oriented classes and something that I've found has been very valuable for a lot of people learning this methodology because it represents a visualization of why a stock that has gone down, which most people would say, hands off, never touch a stock that has gone down. Well, what we do as dividend growth investors is the exact opposite. The only time we buy a stock is when it's come down. Now, that doesn't mean we go out and we buy every stock that comes down. I kind of think of it as, you know, think of a, 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 a box of money that is floating down a uh, rushing rapids of a river heading towards a waterfall. Momentum is real. There's a downward slide in stock prices right now, but there's a box of money out there somewhere. Not all boxes are gonna have the money in it. Not all those boxes are gonna be worth saving, worth you jumping into the rapids to try to grab it out of the water before you fall over because there will be horrible stocks that don't deserve your attention as a long-term investor that are gonna spiral out of control and their share loss is going to be very, very violent. And you're not gonna appreciate that. So again, I wanna be very clear about this. This is not for the faint of heart. We now have a very sizable pullback in Procter & Gamble. But keep in mind that Procter & Gamble has approximately 60 years in a row of dividend growth. In fact, I could take it a step further and say that they have 130 years without ever cutting their dividend. There's not one person on this planet that's alive today that has ever seen Procter & Gamble cut their dividend. So if there was ever a stalwart in the dividend growth investing world, Procter & Gamble's right up there with the best of them. Now, just because it represents consistency from a dividend perspective and it never cuts its dividend, doesn't necessarily mean it's right for you either. This is no Tesla. When you buy a stock like Procter & Gamble, make sure you have the right expectations in check. You know, can you expect potentially, let's say 8% annualized returns? I think that's reasonable. Should you expect 20% annualized returns over the next 10 years? No, I do not think that is reasonable. But if you are somebody that wants an income component to your portfolio, I think Procter & Gamble and all the things they sell, whether it's, you know, Old Spice deodorant or uh, we've got, you know, shampoo or diapers or uh, baby wipes or whatever it is. Remember Tide? Uh, they had a, some great Tide commercials during the Super Bowl. This is a company that is likely going to continue to be profitable in good times and bad. So if we are to go into some sort of a bear market in the S&P 500 in the coming year, I would anticipate that Procter & Gamble will fare better. Now be careful with that because I would also anticipate if we truly do go into a bear market, we might find lower prices in Procter & Gamble than where we're at right now. But I don't think it will be as ugly as what the rest of the market has to give back because it's already done a good job of giving back a lot of it. So the reason why I'm bringing this up here today is because you'll notice that this has come down below this green line on this chart. Now this green line represents average high yields. And it doesn't work like a charm every single time, but it does a reasonably good job for those that are looking to buy high quality merchandise on the cheap. I'll leave it up to you to determine whether Procter & Gamble fits the bill of high quality or not, because you know that's a uh, qualitative term, right? To me, it represents a high quality company, but to you, you might not think that in those same terms, and that's okay. Again, there's lots of room with, in the market for disagreement. But you know the way I kind of think about it in my own head is, you know, had I been a buyer of Procter and Gamble, which has been on the dividend aristocrat list 
for eons. Remember, it only takes 25 years to be on the aristocrat list. They have 60 plus years of dividend increases. Um, had I been somebody who had bought the stock at other times of average high yield, would I be a happy camper today? Generally speaking, the answer is yes. Had you bought this stock you know, back here in 2008 and 2009, not up here at 74 bucks, but after it came all the way down here and touched this green line at about 47, I'm guessing you're a pretty happy camper. Same thing goes right here early in the next year when they raise that dividend. Of course, that average line goes up as well. But if you're buying anywhere in that zone, you're generally pretty happy about it. Same thing over here. When it pulls back in price, touches this green line, you're pretty happy about that. The one kind of outlier was right over here. You can see that you know, had you bought it on the green line right here, you probably would have been pretty happy with yourself for a few months as that thing had ratcheted higher, actually a few weeks. Um, but eventually it spilled over uh, and got even uglier before stabilization. So again, it's a reminder that this, is, this isn't predicting anything. This is not guaranteeing anything. You're giving yourself a reasonable chance based off of history. This is a stock that is currently yielding 3.44%. That's above average for itself. And as a consistent dividend payer over history, I think it, uh, it, it's worthy of consideration for a long-term portfolio. But again, I have to stress, since this is a, uh, a presentation here that is often received by traders, if you're a trader, you're probably looking at this and saying, yeah, I'm not getting in the water. I'm not trying to save this from a potential waterfall that might turn out like something like this. This is something where if you have longer term money set aside for yourself or maybe your heirs or whatever that you don't need, or maybe you're a, you're a new investor and you're just too nervous to invest in something like Tesla because it doesn't have operating profits and you want to have a calmer experience. Sometimes I call it swan, sleep well at night. Um, this could be a calmer experience for you. Not a guarantee, but it could be, judging by history, if you're gonna buy this stock, this is a reasonable place to get involved with the name. So you could buy the stock right here. I know a lot of times you guys comment, hey, I wish you guys would do more just pure stock trades because some of you guys don't understand options trading. I get that. Reason, by the way, David and I don't do that very often during these videos is because it's, just, it's a practical reason. We would chew up too much capital, right? Procter & Gamble is meant to buy it right now and hold it for the next 10 years minimum. Um, if we're constantly chewing up our capital, you know, within just a few trades, we would have already, you know, chewed through all of our capital of our account, and then we wouldn't have any more uh, buying power left in our, in our account here to show you for future videos. So it's more of a practical thing more than anything there. So if you're somebody that's looking for just a stock to buy and hold for the next 10 years, I think Procter & Gamble represents, represents a very interesting opportunity at these levels at $80.22 uh, where it closed uh, here today. So with that, let's go ahead and start winding down the video. Really appreciate you guys checking these out. Another gut check day uh, here today with the markets. Uh, again, that's the price of admission. It's not fun. I don't enjoy looking at all the losses in my portfolio on a day like today. Uh, I don't get any kicks out of it, that's for certain. But it is a reminder that um, there is risk in the marketplace. There's a reason that stocks are priced the way that they are. Um, we have to pay attention to that risk. Uh, if you're somebody that is looking towards the long term, then this risk that everybody else is freaking out about could very well represent an opportunity to you. You can just invert your thinking and flip your mind on itself. And if that's the case, then maybe Procter & Gamble is an example of a stock that could fit the bill for you there uh, that have the truly long-term in mind. So with that, um, I've got a big birthday coming up this week. And believe it or not, I'm actually going to turn 40. And so... Um, that's a tough one for me. I tell you, when I was growing up, there was only one birthday I remember of my dad's and that was his 40th. And so I, I'm thinking to myself, maybe I, I actually am getting kind of old here. So anyway, I'm going to go try to find uh, some sunshine, uh, enjoy myself a little bit this weekend. Uh, you'll have David with you here tomorrow. Hopefully the markets uh, don't go crazy to the downside, but only time will tell there. Uh, I'll look forward to joining forces with you again next Tuesday. Have a great night, everybody. Best of success. Bye-bye.